So we, our primary objective of this conference was to foreground new insights related to ethics, law and justice from Hindu primary sources and languages indigenous to the Indian subcontinent, like Sanskritam and Tamil amongst others, and published secondary sources in English that have engaged with some of the primary sources of Hinduism. So I think we can say that most of what we have done uh, have you know, remained in this within these parameters. And to that extent, I think this conference has at least achieved some of its objectives. We have, uh, we started with a, a book launch. Uh, the book launch was uh, by of Sridhar Puttarajuri, who's an advocate on record at the Supreme Court of India and an author now. His book is, was called, is called Maxims from Mahabharata. Subsequently, we had uh, in total six guest lectures and seven paper presenters. Uh, for the lack of time, I'm not going to attempt to summarize each of these in all detail, but I think I would mention at least the titles to make sure that, uh, you know, that's on record. So Sridharji spoke on Indic perspectives of rule of law, followed by uh, Ila ji, Ila Sudhani ji, she spoke on her experience with the Law of Evidence project of the Indica Center for Law and Justice. Uh, Sai Deepak then spoke about introducing Indic jurisprudence in the current legal framework. And finally, we had Dr. Sri Lakshmi Pedada ji, who spoke on the topic of Dharma as virtue jurisprudence. This was followed by a special session by Dr. Paturi, who spoke on the topic, what can contemporary jurisprudence learn from the equation of Satyam and Dharma in Vedic thought? After the lunch break, we had then the seven paper presentations. Uh, we started off with Professor Dr. Gauri Mahudi Kaji, who spoke on investigation of theft as gleaned from Abhigyana Shakuntala. And I must mention over here, that Dr. Mahulikar ji needn't have done this, uh, but like in the Gita, like in the Mahabharata, Sri Krishna comes down and says, I am going to do my karma and show that I'm doing my karma. Similarly, uh, Gauri ji very uh, kindly responded to the call for papers and presented a paper and went through this entire process and a special thanks to her uh, for doing that. Uh, that was followed by Srinivas Jamala Madaka. He spoke on the applicability of Lakshana, Lakshana with respect to uh, Indian jurisprudence. Uh, Brunda Karanam then spoke on interpretation and exploration of Mimamsa and its contemporary relevance. Arvind followed that up with Nyaya Shastra ethics of debate, fairness to ideas and people. That was followed by Aradhana's uh, presentation on social construction of Danda, punishment, and Prayashchita, penance, in early India. Sujata Balasubramaniam ji then very quickly but uh, with very good insights spoke on articles 36 to 51 of the Indian constitution, tracing their Indic origins. And the last of the paper presentations was by Shivakumar GVG on the position of individual rights in the Bharatiya Parampara, a karmic perspective. Um, to do justice, to do a little more justice to the paper presenters, given that they have taken the effort to actually go through this entire process, in their own words, they had shared some of their key takeaways for uh, each of their papers, and I'd like to quickly go through them. Uh, Gauriji had uh, said that theft types and punishment according to the Hindu law books was point one. Analysis of the theft episode in Shakuntalam, human psychology playing its roles in the investigation and punishment. A third point, which she felt was a takeaway from her talk, was present day method of investigation and punishment for theft according to the Indian Penal Code. Views on that. And finally, study of theft in three time periods mentioned above with a conclusion that Hindu law books aimed at an integration of Adhi Daivik 
आधि भौतिक एंड आध्यात्मिक जम्मल मड़क श्रीनिवास देन स्पोक विद हिस्ट्री पॉइंट बींग फर्स्ट स्टेप टूवर्ड्स इंटर डिसिप्लिनरी और मल्टी डिसिप्लिनरी स्टडी एज एम्फोसाइज इन द नेशनल एजुकेशन पॉलिसी ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी uh indicates transformation from a perseverance mode to application mode of shastra vigyana or indian knowledge systems and that is paper highlights the importance of nyaya shastra as opined in kanadam paaniniyam cha sarva shastro pakarakam uh brunda karanam uh, her key takeaways in her own words the principles of mimamsa being methodolog- methodical and scientific in their approach are efficient tools of interpretation mimamsa would aid in bringing about consistency clarity predictability and uniformity in interpretation while there have been attempts by a few judges to introduce mimamsa principles in statutory interpretation they have not been applied consistently by the courts there is also a lack of clarity in their application in few cases the application of mimamsa in today's context is not without challenges hasty application without proper understanding and appreciation of the principles is not desirable however these challenges may be overcome by joint efforts and engagement of sanskrit scholars mimamsa experts and the legal fraternity introduction of mimamsa along with modern statutory interpretation in legal studies would be a step forward in familiarizing law students lawyers and judges with the indigenous system of india which could be applied in appropriate cases arvind ayer's takeaways in his own words the nyaya sutra treated across indic philosophical schools as a textual foundation of epistemology and dialectics contains a list of practices to be avoided during debate both in the interest of truth and in the best interest of all persons concerned throughout the nyaya sutra characterization of debate malpractice we can discern the key underlying purpose as the protection of the ideas of each debater against misrepresentation nyaya sutra principles of protecting ideas of all parties from misrepresentation when applied to contentious contemporary legal questions like what constitutes an essential religious practice can improve public confidence in the legal process public order and public understanding aradhana singh's takeaways firstly she says i would like to highlight the importance of sanskrit literary texts especially the dharma shastra corpus of literature for doing a history of law ethics in early india these texts elucidate a lot of important details on the very conceptualization of norms and therefore reading them within the historical context in which they were produced and circulated can turn out to be immensely beneficial for this field of study secondly a detailed study of the crime punishment and sin penance binary depicts how these ideas evolved over a period of time for as we move from the sutras to the shastras one witness witnesses a shift in criminal laws and rules of penance where they are portrayed as increasingly distinct entities the overlapping dimensions undergo a separation of sorts due to the changing socio political scenario where the king assumes an active role in the entire setup of as a uh, dandadhar thirdly an analysis of the punishments and penances prescribed for sexual offenses reveals that the two doctrines were socially constructed as they depended heavily upon the two prominent social categories of the times that is gender and caste alongside other minor factors these two played according to her the most uh, prominent role in the determination of the severity of punishment and the types of penance to be performed from a long list available this in turn ensured that the hierarchy and dis- discrimination emerged in society in fur- is further legitimized by the legal codes sujata bala subramaniam ji uh, her takeaways in her own words the concept of welfare state has always been a part of indic thought uh, on governance shastras like arthashastra shukra niti mahabharata etc provided for a this for a welfare of provided directives I'm sorry for a welfare state the directive principles of state policy of the indian constitution can be better understood in the context of the nitis uh, of these texts shivakumar ji the position of karma 
in the Vedic ontology based on Purushartha and Srishti Sthiti Laya, how Purushartha and Karma help us reimagine individual rights within the Vedic ontology and application of this framework to freedom of expression as an individual right. Now, with these mentioned, uh, and we have 11 minutes more, within the next six minutes, and before Nagaraji then comes over to kind of thank and close the session, I'd like to touch upon certain points that I felt might be relevant at a framework level uh, in, in this conference uh, and from some of my own work as well. So uh, let me over here see if I can pull up the presentation over here. Not able to. So let me actually do this. And given we are short of time, I think uh, Nagraji, why don't you go ahead with uh, the the final part of this presentation so that we stick on stick on to the time. No, you have something to say. Please go ahead. Uh, I think I think also yeah. Without the presentation, yeah. Whatever comes to your mind. Yeah. Uh, but we have ten minutes, and I know that you have some important things to say as well. So I think let's go ahead no, with all, what you All that I have to say is thanks. Yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> all right. Uh, let me just actually pull this up while we are talking. Hold on. Without presentation. Agaji, do you want to? Without the presentation also. Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, okay. So I think uh, I wanted to show actually a framework by Kanchi Acharya. Uh, Mahaparivar Sri Chandrasekharendra Saraswati. Uh, his book called The Vedas, I think, uh, gives a very good, uh, at least to me, uh, it, it solved a big problem of trying to get a big picture of the Vidya Sthanas themselves. And this book is called The Vedas. It can be looked up on Amazon. But at a since I mentioned at a framework level, I wanted to just touch upon certain things which I think might be useful, especially for people who are coming new to the whole idea of Shruti Smriti, Dharma, and then Dharma Shastras. So first is uh, Kanchi Acharya's that framework, it's called Chaturdasha Vidya Sthana. Uh, it's an A3 uh, size sheet, which is available in that book, The Vedas. Uh, Professor uh, Mahamahopadhyay Kurad Subramanyam ji, based on Kanchi Acharya's framework, he's actually added more detail to, you know, this, that framework, or especially to the Chaturdasha Vidya part. Uh, for instance, he's broken down the Yajurveda part and he's added a lot more detail. This is available on his, you know, blog, uh, uh, Kuradium. So anybody who really wants to kind of get this big picture view, uh, this might be a great, uh, great resource to actually uh, check out. Now, uh, P.V. Kane, recipient of Bharat Ratna Shri P.V. Kane's name was mentioned uh, in this conference a couple of times, but uh, it is difficult, I think, to do a history of Dharma Shastra or law or Dharma and Dharma Shastra related conference without actually mentioning the voluminous amount of work that he's actually uh, put in. And I, I think uh, on the slide, I had just the chronological table and the framework. Uh, I think that's a great place again to start as a, to get a framework view. Not that I completely agree with this framework or that's that's not the point, but I think for people like me at least, who have come much later, uh, getting these bird's eye views of, you know, the topics have been very helpful to position ourselves and, you know, contribute in very, very small and meager ways. Um, in that context, I think I'd like to also mention uh, Sri Vishwanath Narayan Mandlik's work on Vyavahara Ma Mayukha, uh, which is also called uh, or Hindu Law. Uh, this was published in 1880, and I think it's available in... Um, is available in archive. Uh, there is one particular table of which, which just blew my mind off. Uh, this is Smriti's quoted by Neela Kantha. And he lists literally 97 different Smritis that is mentioned in this particular text, you know. So, and this is a table which is actually available in his book. And I think it really helps again, like I said, uh, with the big picture view. None of them have claimed that it is comprehensive, uh, which I think comes from their humility. But I think these are great uh, points to kind of uh, anchor and, and study. Uh, again, I, I would be, I'm in the names that I'm mentioning, I'm not mentioning perhaps a lot of other people, 
but that is also uh, for the lack of time, maybe my own ignorance. And also I'm kind of mentioning some of the people who you know have contributed directly to my work, but not limiting to that, who I think could, uh, could be useful pointers in this domain largely. Sri Rama Joyce's books, there are many, but I'll mention three, uh, Legal and Constitutional History of India, Ancient Legal, Judicial and Constitutional System, Seeds of Modern Public Law in Ancient Indian Jurisprudence, and Human Rights, Bharatiya Values. I think these three books uh, together uh, present a tremendous amount of information uh, from a contemporary point of view, which I think is necessary. Um, Thereafter, uh, I, I think we, while we have spoken about P. V. Carnegie's work and his book, is, his voluminous multi-volume work across three decades uh, is called A History of Dharma Shastra. Uh, in the 21st century, Oxford has published a new history of Dharma Shastra, which is a single volume book called A Hindu Law. And I'm not sure how many people have actually seen that book. It was published in 2018. Uh, one of the, and it's edited by Patrick Oliver and Donald Davis uh, Jr. I'm not going to read the entire description, but I think I want to mention this. Uh, through pointed studies of important aspects and topics of Dharma and Dharma Shastra, this comprehensive collection shows that the history of Hinduism cannot be written without the history of Hindu law. Part one provides a concise overview of the literary genres in, dharma, in which Dharma Shastra was written with attention to chronology and historical developments. I'm not going to read the entire description. Um, now, I want to also foreground the fact that Dominic Bujastic, who's considered, again, a very influential scholar, calls Patrick Oliver and uh, his book, uh, pa calls Patrick Oliver, quote, from the world's leading authority on the history of Indian dharma, unquote, okay? From the world's leading authority on the history of Indian dharma, unquote. Now, these are, I think, very, very large and tall uh, statements uh, to be made. Um, and I think careful attention needs to be paid on, on what, you know, goes behind such uh, work. And while I say this, I want to be very respectful. I think uh, Dr. Oliver is a, you know, uh, has been in this field for a very long time. There are no ad hominem comments whatsoever over here. But I think I'm foregrounding this to make sure that some attention is paid to engaging with these new history, a new history of Dharma Shastra, literally, which, is, which has come out. And uh, to that extent, I, I've written about six papers engaging with very few factors, very few aspects of this new history of Dharma Shastra. I'd like to read out just the abstract of one of the papers. And the title of that paper is called The Earliest Textual Attestation of Dharma Shastra in Moore, An Analysis of, the chronolo of Chronology in a Dharma Reader. Now, which is the earliest extant textual attestation of the word Dharma Shastra? Is the birth of the Dharma Shastra genre causally linked and incontrovertibly indebted to the Buddha and Emperor Ashoka? Patrick Oliver's 2016 book, A Dharma Reader, Classical Indian Law, contains statements that appear to be pointed answers to the above questions, a pointedness that I find pregnant with serious revisionist implications of profound consequence, not just to the textual history of the term Dharma Shastra and the origins of the Dharma Shastra genre, but also to the history of the idea of Dharma itself and perhaps to some people of those traditions in which dharma is seen as sanatana. In this paper, I have foreground aforementioned statements of Oliver, delineate some of the, their revisionist implications, and present a critical analysis of some of his reasoning and conclusions thereof. In doing so, a case is made for the need to pay attention to attempts at altering chronology, particularly those that enable uh, tendentious attributions through imagined cause and effect hypothesis accompanied by sweeping consequences. Now, in the conclusion of that paper, uh, I've written that based on everything in the analysis section above, I conclude that Oliver's statements, which appear to contain answers to the two questions raised in the abstract, which is the earliest extant textual attestation of the word Dharma Shastra. And second question being, is the birth of the Dharma Shastra genre 
causally linked and incontrovertibly indebted to Buddha and Emperor Ashoka, I show that these are, you know, on highly infirm grounds, is the reasons for shifting the chronological epoch of Gautama Dharma Sutra to the late second century BCE have been closely studied and found to be insufficiently reasoned and simply unwarranted. Some of these doubts he injected to make his case for the above shift were specifically analyzed and addressed in some cases by invoking research published well before uh, Patrick Oliver. Assuming his own alteration in chronology to be a proven fact, his new hypothesis about some Brahminical scholarly community having start, started a brand new genre uh, of literature called Dharma Shastras after 268 BCE in response to and as an inescapable reaction to a greater centrality of Dharma in Buddhism and its imperial efforts of uh, Emperor Ashoka to propagate Dharma. While this is clearly innovative, uh, it is simply imagined, at least in my view, and with no direct verifiable historical evidence and has been presented as a plausible induction. Some of the reasons to support this induction have been pointedly analyzed and have been shown to contain issues, though those arising from omissions and those from what he has actually commissioned, thereby presenting a case for this revisionist invention with startling con consequences to be seriously reconsidered. At least aspects of a dharma reader included uh, in my study, do not live up to the words such as exceptional detail, historical precision, expository illumination, and other such glowing terminologies that are being used to describe this work. And it is fitting perhaps to close this by citing Oliver's own translation of Gautama Dharma Sutra 111, Vedo Dharma Mulam, and he has translated that as the source of law, is the Veda in his Oxford 1999 publication. And second point being Kane's translation of Rugveda 331, Dharmani Sanata as ancient ordinances. Now, subsequent to this, there have been five other papers and I don't want, we don't have the time to go through this, but I just wanted to mention this at the closing of a conference on uh, Hindu thought on, you know, ethics, law and Justice, which deals with some aspects of Dharma Shastras, this is a new development that perhaps needs some attention.